We are drowning in bullshit. <sighs> Politicians are unconstrained by fact. Disinformation has reached epidemic levels. Even my field in science has been tarnished by predatory journals and the press release. And yes, even Ted has been known to create a platform for a little bit of stylistic BS. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the last year about fake news. And the consequences really should not be ignored. But I have to admit, some of it's actually kind of good and pleasantly entertaining. Earlier this year, I learned <laughs> that Taylor Swift is dating Senator McCarthy. Now, there are a lot of fans that have been disappointed with this. They've been disappointed because it was the fourth guy in six months. Fortunately, we do have, we do have fact checkers on the web, and someone noted that Senator Joseph McCarthy died 50 years ago, so we're good there. Now, this kind of fake news is a needed reprieve from our intense, politically charged news cycle that we see every day. But what happens when news like this starts moving around the internet? According to AWD News, Israel was threatening Pakistan with nuclear weapons if they send troops into Syria. Now, this sort of thing, um, you know, we look at this and we say, well, there's grammatical errors in the headline, if you look closely. They were talking about the wrong defense minister in Israel. It was irrefutably fake news. It was taken down. There was no debate whether this was real. But it wasn't taken down soon enough. In response to this fake news item, the defense minister of Pakistan tweeted back with a sword-rattling tweet. Israel forgets that Pakistan is a nuclear state as well. Now, most of the fake news out there on the web is a minor annoyance, and as I mentioned, sometimes entertaining. But the kind of fake news we're seeing now, world preservation is at stake. Now, one of the things that we've tried to do, my colleague and I, is figure out how we can bring our skills from what we do in science in refutation and teach a class on spotting and refuting BS. We want to teach students how to address these kinds of things they're seeing in the news, address them in dinner conversations, but we have a particular emphasis on a new school kind of BS. This is BS that's wrapped in data, graphics, statistics. It can carry this veneer of authority that really is undeserving. Earlier in January of this year, on January 11th, we released the course. We woke up the next morning, and there were tens of thousands of people from all over the world in one night. It really seemed to have struck a chord. When we officially made it a registered course at the university, it filled within less than a minute. 160 seats filled within less than a minute from 40 different majors across campus. That's what I'm most proud of, is that everyone is recognizing this sort of thing. But of all the things that have made us get most excited about it, is that 60 universities have now contacted us to teach this kind of material. Now, we have a version that doesn't have swear words in it, too, so that's good. We have callingbull.org. Um, but it really does seem to have struck a chord. Now, we have 40 hours of lecture. We continue to make this content available. But one of the most important principles that we want to teach to students and the general public, it's something that comes from Brandolini's BS asymmetry principle. It's, it's a great principle if you study bullshit studies. And that is that it's an order of magnitude, it takes an order of magnitude, more energy to refute BS than it does to create it. In other words, BS is easy to create. There's incentives to do this. It doesn't cost that much money. There's not really legal ramifications for it. 
But once it gets out there, even after refutation, it's hard to clean up. Now, the recent um, Pizzagate scandal is really a perfect example of this. According to the conspiracy, Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring in the pizzeria of Comet, uh, a Comet Ping Pong. It's a restaurant in DC. Edgar Welch, a citizen of uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, wanted to do something about it. He'd been reading it on the internet. He decided to pick up his gun, get in his truck, and drive to this pizzeria. Luckily, no one was hurt. But even after he found out that it was fake, even after Alex Jones, who was one of the primary promulgators of this particular news, after he apologized and admitted that it was not true, earlier this year, after all of that, families felt so strongly that this was a cover-up, that the conspiracy was alive, that they went to the White House lawn and protested. So Brandolini's asymmetry principle, we see it all the time, even after you clean up. Now, the creators of this fake news and the promulgators are certainly to blame. They share most of the blame. But we, the readers, are to blame as well. Earlier this year, Science Post published a story saying that 70% of Facebook users only read the headline. I hear some laughters in there, so I, I, I think I know what's coming. Um, at the time of this screen capture, by the way, this was a real headline, there were tens of thousands of people that had shared this. But if you were one of those rare readers of stories, one of those rare readers, you would have found lorem ipsum. <laughs> Random text. This was not a real story, it was a joke on readers who only read headlines about a story that only read headlines. So that's lesson number one, let's read beyond the headlines. It takes a lot of effort, and we are inundated with information. We can't read everything. So people have said, give me one slide that you want to give to the class if that's all you could give. It's four words. It's an addendum to this first lesson. And that is, think more, share less, instead of share more. <laughs> but I will say that it's not the headline sp spreading that concerns me the most. It's the imagery spreading. It's those deep emotion-evoking memes that pass around the internet that drive wedges between us. In January of last year, Seattle Seahawks thumped the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah. And they were celebrating in the locker room. But they weren't celebrating over the victory. They were celebrating over Michael Bennett burning the American flag. Do you see it? Now you should see it. Now, of course, this was photoshopped. And the Facebook page that put it up originally did take it down. They even admitted that it was fake. But not soon enough. It's these kind of images that are driving wedges between us that are simply not true. So watch out for those emotional hooks. They get in our way of being able to truly BS detect. They get to the deep centers of our brain, and it's hard to think logically. Now, I will say that students are good at finding these things. We've done lots of little tests back and forth. We do quizzes, fun quizzes in class, where we have them sort of differentiate between the real and not real. They can identify those memes and those headlines, and they even create good habits of mind by reading headlines. But the thing that we're finding most people are struggling with the most is this BS wrapped in charts. They're everywhere now in this world of big data. Now, there's been a lot of discussion around the gun laws. One of the controversial laws that was enacted in 2005 in Florida was a law, the stand your ground law. The idea was that if you feel threatened in your home or in your place where you deserve, you can respond with lethal force. Now, there's, there's been lots of debates backwards and forwards on whether this would decrease or increase crime, decrease or increase gun deaths. But if you look at this chart, 
The gun law was enacted in 2005, and you see that the black line goes down. But something highly unconventional is going on with this graph. <laughs> Most of you have noticed it. The zero was put at the top. Now, that tells a much different story. But I'm starting easy for you. There are many more subtle ways to manipulate data arguments, because that's where they're coming. <laughs> now, if I, wa <laughs> if I wanted to write a story about the industriousness of German workers, compared to those lazy French, <laughs> I could make a chart like this. You know, and this chart, the line itself is more than three times bigger than the other line. But you can clearly see that 40 and 37 are not that different. So what am I doing here? I'm simply zooming in. And I can zoom in enough to exacerbate those differences so much, I can make any argument I want with a chart. There's many easy ways to manipulate with axes. And this is where we all can become good BS detectors, because it's easy to manipulate, but really easy to call BS on. A more honest way of reporting this is to include the zero. Simple, but you'll see this all the time. I see it every day, literally every day. Now, there's also been a lot of discussion about climate change and the raise in temperature. NASA makes these data available, so anyone can plot them. They typically look like this over the last 100 years. From the 1950s, we see a general two-degree increase. Now, we can debate whether that's uh, uh, significant or not, but this is the data. Now, I can do something magical. By just zooming out far enough, I can create a graph like the National Review claimed was the only graph you needed to see on climate change. Zoom far enough out, and you can even take a diagonal and make it look flat. So that's the lesson here. It sounds a little more technical, but everyone in this room can start sounding smart in a board meeting or anytime they read their newspapers. Look out for axes manipulation, both zooming in and zooming out. You can create different arguments all the time. But people ask me, aren't these honest mistakes? And actually, yes, I truly am an optimist on, of people, and I think most of the time they're honest mistakes. But how can you tell honest mistakes from shenanigans? Ask three questions. They're really useful. Ask, who is telling me this? How do they know it? And what do they have to gain from it? Imagine that I'm telling you right now, I've got a new vitamin. It's going to make you 24% smarter. Just meet me after my talk. I'll give you a great deal. Now, you will call BS on that. That's easy. But we want to do that in all circumstances in graphs as well. But what we're seeing in our media every day is the selling of narratives from our left media and our right media. We need to be aware of this. Earlier this year, MSNBC tweeted the following during the debate on the immigration policy. Whether you agree with it or not, this was what was tweeted. It said that international applications at American schools were down 40%. Now, something I tell my students all the time, dig to the source. Students have been hearing this since the early days of librarian exposure as elementary kids. But do this. So thank you, librarians. Good job. But here's the actual report. If you dig to the report by the American Association of College Registrars, here is the main finding. The finding was not that the applications were down 40%. They were down at 40% of the schools which is a much different story. 1%, 2% in these, 40 per, these other 40% of the schools. But here's on top of that, you find that it was up at 35% of the schools. So much different stories. Now, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, or too bad in this case, it probably is. This is a favorite among the students. I have this almost every day in class. They'll come running up to me in class and they'll say, I found something that sounded too good to be true. And they're just so excited. They're pulling up their computer. We look at it, and they generally are right. Use this one. This one's a lot of fun. I use this one every day as well. Now, this narrative selling is not just a left media problem. The right media has been known to share a few narratives of their own. The food stamp discussion has certainly been one. Last year, they reported that $70 million had been lost to fraud. Sounds like a big number. 
Should we even keep the program around? That's a lot of wasted money. But one thing I tell my students is that you need to put those numbers in context. $70 million means nothing unless you know what it is in the full budget, in this case, or the context for which that number came. Now, we teach students how to do Fermi estimations and ways of testing the plausibility of an argument. I won't go through that, but I will show you that if you do that quickly, the actual budget is about 30 billion. It's actually higher, but through this estimation, through a behind-the-napkin kind of calculation, you find that it's an incredibly small loss rate. Most of retail and Nordstrom here in Seattle and, and Starbucks, they would love the kind of loss rate that's been shown here. <laughs> but that's not the best part of this story. The best part of this story was that the agriculture department was a little bit irritated, and they demanded a retraction. Fox News did acquiesce and admitted that the number was not real. But here's the best part. It was actually much higher. The fraud rate was actually about 10 times greater than that. They were fine saying that because the conclusions held. The fraud rate is actually quite small. Should we cancel a program where 499 people out of 500 are properly using the program? I don't think so. So, you know, in, in Seattle, we are proud of our environmental conscience. But instead of just being carbon neutral, I encourage us all to be bullshit neutral. <laughs> We're humans. We make mistakes, we create, and we promulgate bullshit when we don't even know it. But we need to start cleaning up this mess. I have found in teaching this class that students love to call BS but they generally like calling BS on the other team. The left team, the right team, the red, the blue. But to be sophisticated bullshit detectors, we need to be able to call BS on our own team and then clean up our own yard first. As Neil Postman said so eloquently more than 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, at any given time, the chief source of bullshit that we must contend is ourself. If we want to maintain a strong democracy and we want to strengthen collective decision making, we need to be able to look at our own communities, call BS on ourselves, and we'll be better off. Thank you. <laughs>